there was this man who was trying to push music constantly past him, even music that he loved. And he said to me that, he said, Keith, you know why I don't play ballads anymore? And I said, no. He said, because I love playing ballads so much. Now, that's the sign of an artist, because he has to be conscious enough to see that even what he loves has to move. Miles would rather have a bad band, I think, playing terrible music than have a band that ever that played what he played before. <laughs> you know? And that is against even his natural instinct, which makes it a creative act. It just stopped. And all of a sudden, I couldn't play anything. It's a, you know, like Howard's laid off, you know? He stopped, but he still played. I like that, you get a fresh start. Only thing about that, it took me about two years to get my sound back. Matter of fact, I should be practicing right now. In the first place, to have a microphone that you have to walk to every number and step back and stand. That's some boring shit, even to watch. And it's worse if you do it, you know? It looks funny. You know what I mean? When you get through playing, people applaud and you say thank you. And that's just, it's old. It's an old concept and it doesn't do anything. It's flat. But during that time, it was great, you know? But now, Makes me shake even to think about that time, you know, compared to now. In other words, I'm glad I don't think like that now. If I had to go back and play like that, I'd have a heart attack. So. And it was him who made us realize that, you know, uh, that uh, to be a jazz musician was not just any old thing. It was a great honor. And to be a black jazz musician was the ultimate honor as far as culture is concerned. He was shy, you know. I know he must have been shy because he never said anything on the stage. He never announced a number. Uh, he never announced the, the musicians, who the musicians were. Uh, he, uh, he just played. And he, and he probably figured, say, that's enough. Yeah, yeah, my music will speak for me. I don't need to speak for my, with my voice. We were sort of walking a tightrope with the kind of experimenting that we were doing in music. Not total experimentation, but we used to call it controlled freedom. Just like conversation, same thing. I mean, how many times have you talked to somebody and, and you, you got ready to say, make a point and then you kind of went off in another direction, but Maybe you never wound up making that point, but the conversation you know, just went somewhere else and it was fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Maybe you like where you went. Well, this is the, the way we were dealing with, with music. So when Miles Davis's group came to town, I was right there in the front row that, that, that opening night. They got through with their first set and I was just, I was just in, in, uh, in heaven. And um, so I ran up on the stage after they got through and I followed Miles back into the, into the uh, you know, dressing room area. And I, I saw him back there and I said, uh, uh, Miles, I mean, uh, Mr. Davis, uh, could I sit in with the band? And he just sideways looked at me and he said, uh, go back and sit down and listen. And that was two years before he heard me play. For Tony, he, his father started him playing at nine. So those, those rhythms that he played are the ones that he liked from all the other stuff that he didn't like. And they just stack up in your head, you know? You know, I mean, he wouldn't either have any girlfriends. So everything, he went, his head was open, you know? He would get something from Art Blakey. I mean, you can always, you, rhythm is all around us, you know? Even if you stumble. 
He might want to play that. I could feel that we were making a new statement. We were breaking ground. Before I joined Miles, Ornette Coleman's music had become very uh, important. And so I was very much influenced by what was known then as the avant-garde. So I was interested in expressing the drums and the drum set in a different way. What we were trying to do with Miles' band, at least what I was trying to do and what I, I feel they were trying to do, was to combine or, or take these influences that were happening to all of us at the time and um, amalgamate them, personalize them in, in, in such a way that, that, that when people were hearing us, they were hearing the, the avant-garde on one hand, and they were hearing the history of jazz of, of, uh, that, that led up to it on the other hand, because, you know, Miles was that history, and he was that link. When Miles uh, opened an invitation to playing with the band, I realized the, the instruments involved were electric, and he realized I realized that, and he also realized that I would not normally be doing that and that I did not do that. And I uh, would say that my reason for finally accepting to play was based on the love of his playing. He was very sick one night and he started to play ballads. Now, you have to imagine this because the band was made up of a Motown bass player who didn't know any of these tunes, who was playing electric bass. A drummer who I don't think knew these tunes either. Uh, some percussionists who were totally out of their ballpark because we were starting to play Stella by Starlight or something. And I, I, I was trying to lend help to everybody to know what was going on with, this, with these pieces. But he was so weak that we had to stop and we got off the stage and went in the backstage and I guess I was just trying to hang around see if I could be there at the right time and I had never heard any l band leader say that they pay you to practice right there in front of the people that's dangerous you know you want to be perfect in front of the people that's not what Miles wants Miles wants honesty he wants the music to be as honest as it can possibly be <laughs> 